started officially. You can um, turn your phones down or off. Um, and there's a sign-in sheet um, up at the front on the counter there. There's um, a few press advisories lying around. We'll just give people another minute to get settled. Okay, I want to welcome you all here today. Um, it's a really important event for all of us here. Um, but first, I want to just say some thank yous. Um, I want to thank the Kevorkian Center here for allowing us to use this beautiful space. Um, thank you for the help of Jeremy and Diana and um, Greta Sharn Weber, who's the associate director here at the center. She did a lot of work. Um, to help make this happen. Um, I want to thank our, thank our speakers for coming today from DC, from New York, um, and from Turkey. Um, we're going to have two of our speakers um, over uh, Google Hangout uh, with us today. Um, I think all of us here understand how important this is. Um, there is a trend of repression in Turkey against freedom of expression. Um, unfortunately, we had to have a press conference here a few months ago about academics for peace and the crackdown on academics um, in Turkey. And here we find ourselves again having a press conference about the crackdown on human rights and press freedom activists. Um, so it's very important that all of you are with us today, and I thank our speakers. Um, so I think the order that we will take today is we will... Um, hear from our two speakers who are coming to us through video chat. Um, Mutlu is the first speaker, um, and then we'll hear from Sinem, and are we set with Mutlu? So if Mutlu could introduce yourself, and um, welcome to the press conference. Thank you. Hi, Mutlu. I'm a DC based Turkish affairs analyst focusing in Turkey and Syria. Uh, my opinion, Writings appear in several uh, Kurdish, Turkish, and English outlets. So today I'm going to give you some brief overview of what the uh, freedom of expression, freedom of press in Turkey. Uh, I'm sure most of you are well aware of what's going on, but the organizers asked me to uh, give you a brief uh, presentation. Uh, I want to start with just to uh, remind you all that, uh, according to uh, RSF, I know their representative is there, uh, she's going to go in details. Turkey ranks 151 out of 180 countries in the World Press Freedom Index. The uh, arrests and uh, prosecutions on journals are uh, rising day and day, getting, the situation gets worse and worse. The uh, intolerance and all forms of criticism is there. Uh, government does not want to tolerate anything other than what their version of the uh, events to media as a whole under uh, it, the Iron Fist. Turkey used to be 149, by the way, in 2015. So uh, even in the ranking situation got worse. Uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, uh, he has recently dictated that the, the term uh, terrorism should be even uh, widened, more broadened. That caused uh, many academics, uh, activists, human rights defenders to be uh, uh, put in trial. Uh, according to, in March, uh, Turkish Justice Minister Bekir Bozda had said that almost 2,000 people in Turkey have been prosecuted for insulting President Erdogan since he became president. The number has, it, uh, no doubt, doubtless has increased. The censor, censorship is there, uh, especially Twitter, one of the most effective medium in Turkey for uh, information sharing. Uh, for uh, since the media is under control, very strict government control, so many people rely on social media, especially Twitter. Twitter has been uh, censored so frequently. Turkey is one of the most uh, frequently content-removing countries in the world. 
uh, you need to mention that too. Soda's YouTube uh, has been blocked uh, several times. Uh, when we talk about censorship, we need to mention uh, DIHA, Digital News Procurement News Agency, DIHA. That is the main news agency uh, as a source from the Kurdish regions in Turkey. The, the websites, uh, the agencies, DIHA's website has been blocked for at least 40 times by the TIB, the government body overseas internet communication. And uh, DIHA uh, has at least 12 uh, reporters in the prison uh, in recent months. Some of them are uh, uh, sentenced, some of them are awaiting trial. Uh, so 13 of these uh, uh, reporters are in prison. Uh, and uh, I have the names, I don't want to take the time by mentioning the names, but uh, I talked to one of the DIHA people this morning before I came here. Uh, what he told me uh, is that, that because they are, uh, they are the major source and they are trying to, they are writing about uh, atrocities going on, that's why they are being targeted harshly like this. Uh, but uh, they are going to continue their work, uh, uh, I was told. Uh, also, Özgür Gündem uh, needs mentioning uh, at least 41 journalists uh, who have taken turns adding their names uh, to the newspaper as a, as, as a, a sign of solidarity, sign of support, uh, because there was a campaign launch in May. So at, at least there are 41 journalists uh, there's a court case against these people. Uh, as you all know, on June 20, uh, 20th, uh, RSF rep Shabnam Pinjanji, uh, Ahmed Nesin, and Errol Enderol, these three are uh, now arrested. Uh, this shows that even uh, to show solidarity with a pro Kurdish uh, paper is enough to, uh, put to, to get you arrested. This is this show how dire is the situation, how serious is the situation. And yesterday, uh, to make things worse, yesterday, four more journalists doing the same thing, assume the editorship uh, uh, of the newspaper for one day, symbolically, for uh, more, for five more of them were also called to the courthouse yesterday. Nadira Mate, Yildirim Türker, Turu, Elimaz, Faruk, Balcan, Denisi, Altay. So, uh, the government cannot even tolerate people to stand with uh, this paper. Uh, also, uh, I want to mention that uh, Azadiyah Velat, it's the daily Kurdish uh, newspaper Azadiyah Velat. Uh, it's one of its editor uh, found burned to death in Jizre when the Jizre operations uh, continued. He, he was last heard from, according to CPJ report, he was last heard from uh, January 30, 2016, and in February 24, uh, his remains were identified uh, through a DNA test. He was uh, killed. Uh, this is the situation. Uh, there are, I think, uh, around uh, more than 30 people uh, uh, currently in the prison, in the jail, because of their writings. So, uh, this is a... Hello? Any... Any questions? Did I hear? No, you, you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is this is the, the situation in Turkey. The dissident voices are uh, silenced. Uh, people uh, have been paying very heavy prices to write what they believe or to report what they uh, see. But that's of course uh, seen uh, as a threat by the the authorities, especially like we I can mention. The, the so-called the broader term of uh, terrorism, uh, terrorism not done only by terrorist acts, but those who write, uh, or I think something like that Mr. President had said so. And many people are now accused of uh, simply uh, supporting terrorism or spreading terrorist propaganda. As a journalist, I see uh, this gloomy picture uh, that uh, our colleagues uh, have to work under such circumstances. So it's important that events like this, you folks are uh, doing over there, it's very important to raise awareness uh, that what's happening in Turkey. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer as best as I can.
Yeah, we can take a few minutes to um, have questions if you have any, if anyone has a question to pose. Well, that's a question. Yeah. What, um, what, what would you say is the relationship between the crackdown on the press and, and journalists and the sort of in the crackdown um, that's going on in the Southeast more generally? Is there a relationship in your mind? I think, I think there is no doubt there's a direct relationship between these two. The more uh, the secret operations are going, it gives reason for government to, to strengthen this crackdown. So when there was a peace process, when uh, rather than weapons, uh, ideas were talking, uh, things were much better for it, uh, than what it is. So the more operations continue, the war, the armed struggle continue, this gives good cover for authorities to silence people through such uh, crackdown, to call them, to label them as terrorist uh, spreader of terrorist propaganda. Certainly. So there's uh, many of the Dijle Diha reporters I mentioned, almost all of them were uh, jailed because of reporting the operations, the fight in the Kurdish regions. So the, the, the Azadiya Barat editor, he was uh, burned to death in Jizre, where the UN has, has been referring recently in its report that uh, serious atrocities might have committed. So, yeah, certainly there's a direct, direct relations. The more uh, the rhetoric is changed, the uh, pro-war rhetoric is used, uh, democracy is put aside, uh, operations are uh, continued, human rights, are human rights, uh, freedom of expression, are first to be sacrificed by authorities. So uh, that's why it's very important uh, to stand with peace activists, peace academics. And most of these peace academics, they just want peace. They want violence to stop. They, they call both sides to put aside the, the weapons. So, but they were also uh, labeled, they were also accused of spreading uh, terrorist propaganda or supporting. So certainly there's a direct relations. Thank you, Mokla. Thank you. So we're um, connecting to our second speaker today. Um, hopefully we'll have her with us soon. Um, that'll be um, Sanem, Sanem uh, Doanoglu. She's with the Human Rights Foundation in Turkey. Have Hi, you Sanem. Made a... Can you hear us? Ah, wonderful. So, so I can hear you. I will move out of the way now. <laughs> Welcome, Sanem. Thank you. You can go ahead and um, start here. You okay, so you're, you're waiting for me. Yes. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> okay, first of all, good morning to you and good afternoon for us. And I would like to commence my words with the sincere greetings from Shebnam, behind the bars, but of course, always together with us. And of course, I want to express my appreciation to all participants there with their support and with their attention on behalf of Human Rights Foundation of Turkey. Um, considering the time limits, I will briefly give the legal understanding of the situation. As you may already know and as you may already follow, there has been a campaign uh, in favor of Özgür Gündem newspaper, which commenced on the 3rd of May. And during this campaign, the human rights defenders, reporters, doctors, all the relevant people who have something to say about right to free speech were supporting the newspaper for a one day uh, acting as the chief editor of the newspaper and on the 20th of June 
the sixth editor in chief were called before the prosecutor. I need to correct this sentence as far as they voluntarily went to the prosecutor in order to give their statements. Just three of them, as you know, Errol, Ahmed, and Shebnam, were, were sent to the judge, magistrate judge, in order to be detained. They were charged with the violation of anti-terror law to making the propaganda during their uh, editor-in-chief position, which were all in different days and which were uh, covering different in the news. And when they were sent to the magistrate judge, they were again accused of making the propaganda of terrorist organizations, so-called PKK, KJK. And as you know, they were detained on the 20th of June. On the 21st of June, the prosecutor issued his indictment. It is it's weird for us, for a one day, or actually for a half day, he had that time and effort to have an investigation and to issue an indictment. And on the 22nd of June, these indictments, there are three indictments, one of them belongs to Ahmed, one of them belongs to Errol, and one of them belongs to Shebnam, were submitted to the courts. Just Errol's and Shebnam's indictments are brought by the 13th Heaven Penal Court, but Ahmed Nissin's indictment is pending before the 14th Heaven Penal Court. The indictments are based on the same articles, uh, which is not surprising, but the surprising part of the indictments is that there isn't only the allegation of violating anti-terror law, so-called making propaganda, but also they are accused of provocating to commit crime, and to praise crime and or criminal. You know the articles, you know the photographs, the content and the photos are all related to the Kurdish issue and indeed they are all related to the recent clashes and recent serious human rights violations. The legal text of the indictment is like that. We are waiting now the court to assess and evaluate the indictment and to accept it due to procedural court in Turkey. And whenever the court accepts the indictment, they will assign a date for the first hearings. We are expecting a closed date but of course, when it comes to the unlegal understanding of this whole process, it can be, there is a possible postponement after the long break for the judicial process, which starts with, in September. But yet, we don't have any uh, information when the hearing is going to be held. On behalf of Shebnam Korosunjanje, as the chairperson of Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, we are taking this investigation as a form of criminalization of human rights as a whole. And of course, it's, all these investigations are related to right to freedom of speech, uh, freedom of press, but also what we call on behalf of Shebnam is that it, it's, it's all about right to truth. Not only an illegal and international human rights norm, 
right to free speech is has its own philosophical dimension. So the aim of this investigation is understood by us uh, in order to press, you know, to suppress the right to free to express oneself is trying to be criminalized. And also when it comes to the right to truth again, the recent current serious human rights violations during the curfews uh, in the southeast region of Turkey, where the Kurdish population is living, of course, Chevnan Kurur Fincancı and the rest of the detainees uh, has have published reports and news regarding the serious violations. So it was all about to have a right to know the truth, what was ongoing during these days, and what is still ongoing is a matter of fact. And specifically, when it comes to again Shebnam, you know she is an expert, uh, expert, forensic science expert, but not only that, she committed her life uh, to fight against torture. And well, what she was doing and what she's doing is reporting and documenting torture. So it's also relevant to have the right to truth as a torture survivor. And on behalf of torture survivors, it was also about to release the truth of what has happened during that torture time. We have we see all this criminalization process under these dimensions. Of course, freedom of press is the main concern. Uh, but I cannot. I have. We have concerns when we try to interpret all the investigation process and uh, all the upcoming prosecution process in a legal way. It's not easy for us to define the process in a legal way. If you ask us the articles, we have to say that it's not about articles, but if you still ask for the conditions of arrest, we have lots of things to say, but our first sentence will be a political one, for sure, because this investigation is, and the prosecution, is a message for the rest, is a message for the human rights defenders, is a message for torture survivors, is a message to the whole community, not only in Turkey, but to the whole international community, that the state is ignoring the solidarity. So we have to raise our solidarity at that moment. We don't have that time to wait for the hearing time. And uh, if you have any questions regarding the investigation process and the prosecution, I will be more than happy to answer. But I think I don't have time more to say. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um. Um, is there a, a question or two? Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm a journalist from Columbia Journalism School. Hello. Hi, hello. I'm a Turkish journalist, so um, I'm curious to know what was published on each of these three days on the Özgür Gündem newspaper that brought these charges. Shall I respond? Yes. Uh, yes. Right now, or you feel the question, right? Questions. Okay. Yes, yes, I heard it. Okay. Uh, for the Eros case, the news was about the Musaibin, the clashes in Musaibin, and uh, there was a commemoration of Mehmet Tunç who was allegedly burned in the basement in Jizre, and it was published on the 18th of May. These uh, news articles were published on 18th of May. And for Ahmed Nesim, it uh, has 
the same basically. It was about the status. Uh, people who lost uh, their lives and the professional people, the military officials who lost their lives during the clashes due to the statics and due to the declaration of the relevant bodies. And for uh, and it was published on the 7th of June and uh, on the 13th of May Shebnam is doing her editor chief position. There were four articles. One of them is again related to Musaibin uh, situation, but it was uh, the declaration of KJK Council, and it was saying that we are withdrawing from Musaibin area as far as the civilian population is under risk, under threat. It was giving just the declarations of the relevant bodies. And the other one is like the Ahmed Nesin's news, uh, some statics. And um, the, the other part was about Binej, the annex to the Özgür Gündem newspaper. It was published uh, in Binej, and it was about women uh, and the struggle of women in Rojava. Rojava. So uh, these are the news. There, there are, uh, there is ongoing. Sorry, there are 50 editor in chiefs under investigation. There were, and six of them were rendered with a decision not to prosecute, and most of the news were similar to these news. And not only that. The 16 um, suspects, the editor chiefs, uh, were brought before the court. And when it comes to Shebna Mahmoud and Erol, they are all uh, in jail right now. So it's not about news, it's not about the content, as far as the contents are mostly similar when you compare the other investigations and the prosecutions. Sadam, do you have time for another question? Okay. Of course. Is there another question? Of course, Sadam. Yes. Is, is there any parliament member? Are they in jail? Is, does she have any information about that? Any Turkish parliament member? Not here. Are they did you hear that? The question was, uh, are there Kurdish members of parliament who have been jailed? Right now for uh, acting as editor-in-chief. Related to this. Related, yeah, related. Related. Yeah, about guest editing. About, uh, there are only three editors right now. Uh, who were in support of Özgür Gündem newspaper in jail. And the parliamenters, they, they have lots of problems right now, but not Özgür Gündem newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much to them. Thank you. Um, so, our next speaker today is Margot Ewan from um, Reporters Without Borders. She's the Advocacy and Communications uh, Officer there. So, I'm going to pass the mic down to her. Can everybody hear me okay? So, I just wanted to first thank uh, Research Institute in Turkey for holding this press conference and for inviting me to represent um, Reporters Without Borders, Reporters Sans Frontières, RSF, as we'll call it going forward. Um, I just want to give a little background on our organization. We are the world's largest organization defending freedom of the press and access to information. Uh, we've been around for the past 30 years and we have 12 offices around the world, including our headquarters in Paris. And we have a unique network of local correspondents in 130 countries 
that report on violations of freedom of the press and access to information. We publish reports and press releases on these violations in English, in French, and the local language. And then we use this information to advocate for the release of journalists who are in prison, the return home of journalists who have been taken hostage, and legal reform for better access to information and improvements to journalist safety. Our organization has also enjoyed consultative status at the UN and UNESCO for many years. So as you all know, uh, RSF's representative in Turkey, Errol Onderoglu, along with Ahmet Nesimi and Sednem Kolur Finansi, were ordered to begin pretrial detention uh, last Monday, and they're being charged with uh, terrorist propaganda, incitement to terrorism, and praising terrorism for participating in this campaign of solidarity with Uzgur Gundem. Uh, Errol's prosecution um, is in relation to three articles he published in Uzgur Gundem as the symbolic editor about power struggles within the various Turkish security forces and about ongoing operations against the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK rebels in southeastern Anatolia. Now his colleagues and he, him who were arrested at the same time are facing up to 14 and a half years in prison for just acting in solidarity with uh, Özgür Gündem. Although I have not personally yet had the pleasure to meet Errol, I have heard nothing but wonderful admiration and praise for his work as a press freedom advocate and a journalist from all my colleagues at RSF who have worked with him. He has been our representative in Turkey for the past 20 years. He also compiles quarterly reports on freedom of expression in Turkey for the VNET news website. And he is a board member of IFEX, the International Freedom of Expression Exchange. Errol's tireless defense of the principle of media freedom applies to everyone, whether they are Islamists, Republicans, Nationalists, Kurds, or leftists. He spends several days a week in Istanbul's courts observing the trials of hundreds of journalists, and he often goes on field trips to produce widely read reports, like the report he wrote about journalist Siyan Hayerespener, sorry for my pronunciation, murder in northwestern Turkey in 2009. Because of his detailed work for Bienet, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has chosen him as an expert on imprisoned journalists. It is very clear that Turkish President Erdogan's treat, uh, targeting of Erol and his colleagues is symbolic. Erdogan's government is trying to send a message to all Turkish journalists and human rights defenders that no one is safe from prosecution. Uh, Errol, Ahmet, and Sednam's arrest mark a new stage in the criminalization of human rights activism and a continuing decline in medium freedom in Turkey, which ranks 151 out of 180 countries in our 2016 World Press Freedom Index, as we already indicated. Right now, we count at the very least 10 journalists and citizen journalists who are in prison that we have confirmed have been imprisoned because of their work as journalists, but there are so many more, unfortunately, who we have not yet been able to confirm. All of RSF's team around the world is being mobilized to do whatever we can to free Errol and his colleagues and call for the ridiculous terrorism charges against them to be dropped. Last week, many Turkish and international human rights groups joined RSF in a demonstration outside Istanbul's Metris prison where Errol and Ahmet were being held before they were transferred uh, recently to slavery prison. Um, and last week, uh, RSF Secretary General Christophe de Bois met with the UN Secretary, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who expressed great concern about Errol's detention and his wish that he would quickly be released. Many other officials around the world have voiced their concern regarding these arrests, including the President of the European Parliament, the OSCE's media freedom representative, Dunja Mijatovic, the European Union's High Representative for Foreign Affairs, and the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights. And just last night in Paris, our Paris team held a press conference with our Secretary General and uh, Editor-in-Chief of Turkish newspaper Chumuriyet, Jean Dundar, who, as you all probably know, was convicted of divulging state secrets and sentenced in May to five years and 10 months imprisonment for publishing a story on evidence of the National Intelligence Organization arms deliveries to Syria. His sentence uh, is still waiting to be confirmed by the Turkish Court of Appeals, and luckily he is able to travel where he is making the rounds and 
advocating for the release of the recently detained um, journalists who have participated in this act of solidarity. And his colleague, of course, the Ankara bureau chief of Chimariek was also convicted and sentenced to five years for the same article. Unfortunately for RSF, this is not new, though we are very upset and concerned that our representative for the past 20 years who has so bravely defended every journalist from every type of publication is now the target of these attacks and judicial harassment. Uh, we have submitted a first request for Errol's release in the Istanbul court, but it was rejected last week. Um, so we await the upcoming decision, which was is supposed to be this coming Friday, of the court that will either confirm the indictment or maybe send back to the prosecutor. But we will, of course, attend the first hearing of the trial once there is a date fixed. Uh, we will not stop what we have been doing to advocate for Errol and his colleagues' release. Um, just to wrap up my remarks, I wanted to read a little message from Errol himself that he wrote when he was in Metro's prison because it's very indicative of his strong spirit and his never-ending will to continue to fight for freedom of the press in Turkey. Turkey has persecuted its journalists and opposition members under different regimes, but in recent years, this persecution has broadened and now affects all sectors that are not part of the government. What we have been able to see in Metro's prison is that all of our colleagues, lawyers and activists who have faith in democracy, media freedom and freedom of expression and opinion can act together in an effective manner. I salute the campaign being waged by RSF, of which I am the representative, and by national and international journalist organizations, writers associations, and human rights groups against the harassment of journalists, lawyers, academics, and opposition politicians. Whether in prison or on the streets, together we will continue the fight for our rights. Warm regards, Errol and Eagle Group. If anybody has questions. <laughs> yeah, I think what will the format perhaps for the last few speakers is maybe we'll um, let our speakers give their presentations and then open it up for questions if people have questions at the end. Thank you very much, Margot. Um, our next speaker is Christine Mehta from Physicians for Human Rights. Good morning. Um, as he said, my name is Christine Mehta. I'm a researcher with the Investigations Unit at Physicians for Human Rights. I conducted an investigation to Turkey this past May in response to reports of human rights violations that were occurring during military operations in Turkey Southeast. I did have the opportunity to meet Shebnem Finanji while in Istanbul. She has been a longtime partner and friend of Physicians for Human Rights and is a person who has been a leader in the human rights movement in Turkey for more than 20 years. Physicians for Human Rights joins the organizations here and thousands of our colleagues around the world in calling for the immediate and unconditional release of Shebnem Kodor Finanji, president of the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey, author Ahmet Nisin, and the journalist with Reporters Without Borders, Errol Andaliu. For an end to the prolonged harassment, intimidation, and criminalization of thousands of academics, journalists, teachers, health professionals, and others who have lawfully exercised their right to freedom of expression. The Turkish state has ramped up a campaign against all those criticizing its harsh military tactics in the southeast, which has included 24-hour sieges, uh, which they call curfews, which have been imposed on whole cities and neighborhoods and absolute impunity for reported human rights violations by state security forces. Prominent activists like Shebnem and writers like Ahmed and Errol are illustrative and particularly emblematic of a larger trend being executed by the Turkish state to eliminate criticism and dissent from the state and minimal accountability for how it conducts its counterterrorism uh, operations. I was part of a two-person team that conducted an investigation to southeastern Turkey in response to reports of these human rights violations that have been occurring during counterterrorism operations. We received these reports from people like Shednam and the rest of our colleagues at the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey and the Turkish Medical Association, as well as the news coverage that has been produced by journalists managing to access the highly restricted areas under siege in the southeast. We found that not only is there evidence of human rights violations happening at a large scale, 
but that Turkey is actively muzzling activists who are attempting to demand accountability and an investigation for these crimes. I interviewed dozens of individuals, including health professionals, lawyers, and journalists, who told me about the criminal charges and administrative sanctions being slapped on them for protesting the military intervention in the Southeast, as well as in the case of health professionals, giving emergency medical treatment to individuals that the Turkish state has deemed to be militants, which in the eyes of the Turkish state is a crime, despite the universal medical ethic that requires doctors to provide emergency medical treatment to those who are wounded and injured. Shevnem is just one of many health professionals who has come under fire by the Turkish state for doing her duty, not just to provide medical treatment to the wounded and sick, but to use her skills to document and uncover evidence of human rights violations. Shevnem was one of the key authors and instrumental participants in developing the manual that has been adopted by the UN for effective documentation of torture, uh, which is now known as the Istanbul Protocol. Shevnem is illustrative of a larger trend that we know is affecting journalists and academics, but also health professionals in Turkey. Health professionals in Turkey have presented a challenge to state authority even before now. During the Gezi Park protests of 2013, thousands of doctors and nurses were intimidated, harassed, and criminalized when trying to provide emergency medical treatment to protesters, wounded protesters in Istanbul in 2013. The Turkish state later attempted to bring a lawsuit against the Turkish Medical Association for these actions, despite the fact that the state had done very little to provide emergency treatment to wounded protesters, even in life-threatening situations. PHR had also traveled to Turkey at that time in response to the harassment of these medical professionals, and we will continue to support the health professionals and all of civil society in Turkey while they continue to come under severe pressure from the Turkish state. Turkey's crackdown on dissent the criminalization of journalists for reporting the truth, uh, doctors for providing medical treatment to those in dire need, and civil society for speaking out in support of an oppressed population in the Southeast is likely to get worse before it gets better. This means that the international community needs to continue to step in and speak out even more loudly in continued support of our colleagues in Turkey as their situation becomes increasingly precarious in the coming days. Thank you, and I'll take any questions that you have at the end. Thank you very much. Um, so our final speaker today is Sarah Etkins. She's the Deputy Director for Communications at N America. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, as Chad mentioned, my name is Sarah Edkins. Uh, I'm the Deputy Director for Communications at PEN America, which is an organization that unites US writers with their peers and allies around the world in defense of free expression. I will keep my remarks short as my colleagues from RSF and PHR have done a very good job uh, of summarizing the situation. At Penn, we've watched over the past several years as Turkey has engaged in an escalating crackdown on free expression. The government of Turkey has resorted to the same tactics used by the world's worst jailers of writers and journalists like China, including the sprawling use of anti-terror laws to repress its detractors and the harassment, intimidation, and arrest of supporters, friends, and family of all those who expressed dissent. In 2013, the Istanbul Public Prosecutor's Office actually launched an investigation against our own colleagues at Turkish Pen after the organization spoke out on behalf of another fellow artist, composer Fazıl Say, who was jailed for tweets that were allegedly insulting to religious values. And in February 2016, the Kurdish Pen Center was attacked with impunity. The arrest last week of Errol Erdoğlu, Ahmet Nesin, and Shevneb Karur Finjanji illustrates an acceleration of this dangerous trend. As an organization founded on the principle of writer-to-writer -writer solidarity, PEN is calling on the government of Turkey to halt this legal harassment, to depoliticize the judiciary, and to respect the universal right to free expression and free these three writers and all writers and supporters who have been jailed only for advocating for a universal right. PEN America is also calling on the European Union mm -hmm. and its members to not only to not turn a blind eye to Turkey's human rights abuses and to continue to hold the country accountable for its actions moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have a little bit of time for questions if people have questions for any of our speakers here. We have a couple of questions. 
Hi, you, you just said in your, and anybody can answer these questions, but you talked about not turning a blind eye and to hold them accountable. How, I'd like to hear comments from all of you on how accountable do you think right now the, the United States, and given the whole complexity of Turco, Turkey being a NATO ally, how accountable do you think, how good a job do you think they're doing in holding them accountable? And could the US State Department, the EU, be doing more? Answer. I think they could do more. Um, and Can I just ask it or is sorry. the mic? Uh, so I, I think that the actors that you mentioned, especially within the U.S. government, can do more. Um, they have a lot of influence over Turkey, even if we see that Erdogan is increasingly breaking away from um, usually following along with what maybe the U.S. suggests to do. He's becoming more and more rogue, but I still think that that is no excuse for us not to come at him with our full force. And I think that um, there are many people in um, both the House and the Senate who are dedicated to um, human rights in Turkey and freedom of speech and freedom of the press. It can have an effect, whether it's by going in person and trying to attend the trials or writing letters. I think it's always effective. The more um, naming and shaming that there is on that end, and then um, also whether it's behind closed doors or public remarks from the State Department, from the White House, on these issues is very important, and I think we should all be collectively pushing for that, and we shouldn't give up even if uh, the remarks end up being lukewarm. We should just continue to press on this issue because it's very important, and I think that we do have an advantage of, of having the U.S. government be an ally. I think that it makes it uh, more likely that something will come of that than if it were another country. So I think there needs to be a serious shift in the way that the U.S. and the EU are currently treating the Turkish state. Unfortunately, the refugee crisis has held the EU and the U.S. hostage to President Erdogan's demands. And I think that it is, it, it is quite appalling that the refugee crisis is being used as a political pawn by these three entities. So while Erdogan is becoming increasingly isolationist, I think that the U.S. and the EU, particularly EU key member states, have an obligation to step up their rhetoric when it comes to human rights violations that are being committed by Erdogan uh, and the Turkish state, particularly in the southeast, and the resulting crackdown on freedom of expression that's being caused in the rest of the country. Sure, just to echo my colleagues, um, I do think that the European Union is uniquely positioned to take a stand on this issue. Um, and we have seen uh, some, some comments in the right direction coming out of EU leaders, um, but there is very much more that can be done. Um, and the, the, the migrant crisis is not something to be hiding behind um, at this moment, um, which is why we are really encouraging, especially uh, the EU to speak out on this particular issue uh, and to make it very clear to Turkey that uh, an important part of being a member of the European Union, uh, if they continue to aspire to do so, is to uphold human rights uh, and specifically the right to free expression, which is universally uh, accepted throughout the world. Do you think their expressions of concern are adequate? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what would you like to see? I mean, would you like to see Angela Merkel do something more? Or I mean, do you have any thoughts on what more the EU could do, given this whole sense that it feels that it's being held hostage by Turkey? I mean, I think it's a complex situation exactly because of this, this sort of holding hostage. Um, I think we need to see continued uh, pressure placed, especially on Erdogan, um, in regard to these, uh, these violations, uh, which are ongoing and have been ongoing. You know, this is not new. Um, so the pressure needs to be stepped up uh, from the EU. What we've done so far in the last uh, three years, four years, clearly has not been enough. Any other responses to that? Okay. Are there other questions for our speakers? Any of our speakers? Oh, I was just wondering, are they doing, are they in touch with any congressman, you know, regarding this case? Or something? Yeah, good. Anyone want to speak about actual advocacy campaigns or? So um, at RSF, uh, our US office based in Washington, DC, we do have contact with uh, several members of Congress, which we will uh, update about the arrests of Errol and his colleagues. Um, 
we haven't yet been in contact with them, but it is literally something I'm planning on doing today. Um, and we also have contacts um, at other levels of government in the US. We will push all of these pressure points and ask that our um, the members of the US government and Congress make pleas for the release of Errol and his colleagues. Um, we also have our petition for Errol on our website if you are interested in visiting our webpage. Um, we also have many advocacy efforts at the EU level, but those are my colleagues in Paris that are handling that portion of our advocacy. But I can assure you that across all of our uh, offices worldwide, RSF is, is looking at every angle of how we can put pressure on Erdogan and on the Turkish government to stop the harassment of free press activists and journalists. Uh, just, just briefly to add to that, similarly, we're taking um, similar actions as um, RSF uh, within the U.S., particularly targeting the State Department. Uh, we've been waiting for the most updated uh, information possible, so we're going to start on a new strategy, especially when we hear the date of the hearing, to try and get as many international observers to that trial hearing as possible when it does happen. Um, so far, we have been mobilizing the international medical community, including the International Forensic Expert Group, the British Medical Association, German Medical Association, World Medical Association, to campaign on behalf of the release of all three detainees, uh, in particularly uh, all three of the det detainees, um, even though Shebnam obviously is the, the entry point for the medical associations. Thank you. Is she, is she a doctor as well? She is. She's a forensic medical expert. She's a professor at um, Istanbul University, and she's the president of the Human Rights Foundation of Turkey. Uh, and I have another question. Do you do you fear the three of you at all, given the the um, the history and reputation of, of of danger and being held in by Turkish authorities in Turkish prisons? Do you have any fears for the safety? Of these three people. Uh, <laughs> they can go straight down the, the line again. So, um, after hearing this morning from my colleague in Paris, who um, covers Turkey, that they have been transferred to Salivri Prison, um, which is supposed to be a better quality prison than um, the prison that Errol and Ahmed were in before. Um, I, I understand that Sebnam was in solitary confinement before, and now I think even though this prison is further from Istanbul, that the conditions are relatively good. The, we were in touch with Chandigarh when he was in prison there, they're under pre-trial detention. There were no reports of, of torture on his end. So um, we would like him to be free, but uh, I think for the moment that is not the first concern. And I think um, we need to push for people to be able to visit um, because that will keep pressure that that situation remains um, a safe one while in prison. Um, I agree. Shebnem was, was transferred out of solitary confinement, as Margo said, um, and Senem, her lawyer, has had frequent contact with her, so we haven't had serious concerns about uh, conditions of detention at this point. Um, so our key concern right now is just making sure that they are not held in, in arbitrary detention any longer than needs to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, while there is no uh, immediate cause for concern, of course, uh, we all are keeping a close eye um, on prison conditions and uh, the health and safety uh, of any uh, writer or ally uh, who finds themselves jailed. Um, and a big part of that for Penn is therefore making sure that the case remains in the spotlight, that people are watching it, um, that there is visibility, uh, which can often help prevent any kind of um, mistreatment. Okay, I think that's a good note to end on today. I want to just remind you to sign in if you haven't signed in so that we can um, update you and let you know um, where to find the press release for this, which will have photos, uh, the written statements of our speakers um, and video. And so with that, thank you to our speakers and thank you uh, all for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for organizing this. <laughs>
Yeah, thanks for coming in. Short notice. No problem. Time to do a coffee. I'm happy to send that one. I do. It's written all over and messy right now.